Hi, if you can hear me, uh, please let me know, or if you can't hear me, um, how am I going to be able to ask you that question? One second. Let's see if I can share another screen. One moment. Live start. There is a place you can write to see um, where I would be able to see if you're um, if you're able to to um, one second. Put this over here. Just give me a minute to figure this out. Um, okay, this is good enough. Uh, and let's share this thing. Start screen sharing. We'll share that. Okay, I'm going to begin. Um, and, um, and and I'm going to say I'm Neil uh, Kummer. I, I started uh, Kef in 1979. We were originally just involved with appliance shipping because appliances were a big deal. Taxes were sometimes over 200%, and now they're they went down to 17%. So um, so that's where we're holding now. And then we rent so about two. 25 years ago, we started doing uh, solely relocations. I mean, we still do some level of appliance sales and, and uh, import, but it's mostly door-to-door uh, -door shipping. So um, again, if you have any questions, there's a place where you can write chat. You can, um, you can write questions. And since it's a small crowd tonight, um, or today, wherever you are, um, so please feel free to ask uh, personal questions that you think may you know that uh, that you're uh, you're wondering if I'm going to cover or um, if if I haven't covered further on uh, during the presentation. Okay, so these are uh, and also if there's stuff that you already know well and you, you know just let us know and we'll skip over some stuff. Um, so well, again, we'll wait another minute or two just to see if anybody else is coming, and we'll start. And we'll, but we'll we'll. Um, We'll go back and forth a lot, also, because the the, the material uh, it's uh, it's not so easy to digest the first time. So uh, again, feel free to ask any questions, and we'll go back and forth. And so, if you have any questions, uh, we'll we'll probably cover it on the on on the um, on the other part of the presentation. Okay, so these are the way most things get shipped over to Israel or from Israel or anywhere in the world. There's a big shortage of them right now, uh, which is why prices have gone up. It's one of the reasons. And uh, these are these are uh, here's another picture of one. This is a 20 foot container. This is a 20. This is a 40 foot container. This is what you see in the picture. They're like seven feet high, seven feet wide, and 40 feet long. Hold about 2,000 cubic feet, which is about uh, like a three person um, house or a, th a three bedroom house with all the accompanying stuff. And this is, let's say, a one or two bedroom house, but it all depends on how much furniture you have, how many boxes. Some people have 10 boxes, some people have hundreds of boxes. So uh, it really is a matter of what, what you personally own and what you want to bring. Uh, that's one of the topics we'll, we'll also cover is what to bring. And um, you know what, I'll, I'll start with that even, because I think that's one of the most important uh, points is to bring stuff that you really like and that you want to live with it because because you want to bring stuff that's sturdy or buy stuff and bring uh, stuff that's really sturdy and that's going to last a while because you only have these tax-free privileges once and they're significant they're like um, a savings of uh, at least 30 percent um, over buying things in israel and in israel there tend to be a more much more limited number of sales and or even availability even without sales so anything that you really like that you already own or that you've wanted and haven't yet bought, probably worthwhile bringing um, and uh, buying and bringing. Um, other things that might be worthwhile bringing 
are, um, of course, sentimental items, things you really like. If you already own any of these appliances, those are also uh, good bets, things to bring, things that we've used um, on transformers and our customers have used on transformers uh, very successfully. Uh, we've had the same fridge on a transformer for well over 20 years. Um, so if you already and own a high end or a good quality or fridge that you really like, it's worth, worth bringing it. Um, and then you, if you, you know, if it lasts five years or 10 years or whatever, you've, you've gotten, you know, that kind of free time. Uh, also electric ovens, you can bring a gas oven as well, as long as it's new and those can be easily converted. Electric ovens can be as well. Um, uh, and these smaller appliances, um, the Vitamix, the KitchenAid, uh, and things like that, that are high quality and small appliances also can be used, uh, well used with, um, use that's doesn't that's not the right english they can be used uh, successfully with a transformer a transformer is a big heavy thing uh that makes it makes 110 into 220 220, 220 into 110 and uh and the things work fine we're using a, a kitchen aid on a transformer we're using a gas oven on a transformer we're using a, a big big fridge on a transformer uh, it probably will add a hundred dollars um over the course of, I don't know, a, a year or something, but it's it's well worthwhile um, if you already own it. Um, again, if there's stuff that you really would enjoy having, then this is the time to buy it. Or if there's stuff that you really like, some stuff doesn't ship terribly well. Like if you have um, the entry level of IKEA, that's um, you know, it doesn't ship terribly well because it's it's press board, so it's kind of delicate. Doesn't disassemble, doesn't reassemble very well. So those things you have to think twice about bringing. Um, okay, um, and European appliances you can buy those in Israel. Um, there's also like Tadiran, which is a reasonably good um, a fridge, but I think most people are buying uh, Samsung or uh, Sharp. Um, high-end stuff, there also is some good European high-end stuff that's available at fairly reasonable prices. Again, if you can't hear me or if you have any questions, please um, please uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and, uh, and let me know. Okay, so the purpose of the presentation is to equip you to decide uh, what to ship, um, how to ship it, when to ship it. Um, if you get a, get a clear idea of cost, that's not what I'm going to do. Yael will do that for you. Um, Yael's the head of sales. And also to help you decide where to choose a shipper, how to choose a shipper. Um, the main, uh, we're, we're based in Israel. So that's one basic choice is do you want to ship with a, with a, a former Israeli living in America or with a Ole, you know, even though we've been here for 40 years, you're still Olim. Um, you know, based in Israel. So wherever your shipper is, that's where the liability is. That's where the responsibility is. That's where the buck ends. So um, you're, you're, and it's less of a chance um, uh, of getting surprise costs anywhere because um, we're here. So we'll have to, we really have to face the music right straight ahead if it's, uh, if there's any surprises. It's not like back in whatever, coming from um okay so that's that's that um everybody uh is uh, an agent on only one side and uses an, an, their agent on the other side so there are no shipping companies that own the agencies on both sides of the ocean so that's one thing you have to get used to that you're actually dealing you're dealing uh, if you ship with us, you're dealing with our agent who's you know, well chosen. And we've, as we said, we've had more than 43 years of experience. So we're really, um, I, I, I like to say we've gotten lucky, luckier with time in terms of who our agents became and who our clearers and who our delivery people, you know, we've gotten uh, steadily more lucky. So um, people are more and more pleased. Um, thank goodness for that. Um, so, um, in terms of when to begin this research, so now is the right time. Um, Any time that you're that you have some uh, ability to uh, take time and digest some of the the thinking and the the 
the ideas about this stuff is the right time and it'll help you uh, form your ideas about what to bring. The, the best thing, uh, I'm just going to make a note for future presentations. Um, the best thing is to, is uh, in terms of deciding what you're going to bring, is to start making lists. Um, because as soon as you make a list, and then you can start making, you can make multiple lists. You can have an A list and a B list, you know, if there's room or, and then you can have an absolutely do not ship list. Um, and the earlier you do that, and the more confident you are with that, the less likely um, you are to fall into um, one of the um, big mistakes, which is um, to, uh, to start sorting at the last minute. Uh, even if, and even at the time when the volume estimator is coming, you really want to have it, um, or if he's coming or if he's doing it by, by, um, uh, by video, you really want to have at least in your mind, you want to have 90% of your decisions made even before the volume estimate. You can have multiple estimates done for no extra charge. Uh, they might not always come out a second time, but they might. And they also might, um, you know, for both times, depending on the situation with a uh, corona they might in uh, for both times they might uh, only be doing video estimates um, which are generally just as uh, accurate uh, you know I have truth is I haven't really studied that but my impression is that they're that they they seem to be just as accurate um, um, but the, the what makes for an accurate volume estimate in both cases whether it's a video or in person is um, how diligent you are in terms of planning before they show up, before they show up by video or in person, and also how um, intensively you review, review their work. Um, in other words, they're going to make, with, with nearly every one of our agents in uh, North America, um, makes a volume estimate and, um, and, and they, in writing. So you'll be able to re review their work and see how much they estimated for books, how much they estimated for clothes. Um, you know, if they if they uh, got all the furniture that you wanted to bring, if they left off things that you were in doubt about or decided against bringing. So that's very important. That it has to be, there has to be a continual process of error checking, and you're um, at this at that stage. You're the most important error checker because you're the only person who knows what it is you want to bring. So you have to educate yourself first, like make decisions. And then you have to educate um, our agent. You can educate us as well by sending us copies of lists. And we, we're happy to make, I mean, we will, in fact, uh, help you make decisions about how much um, volume to ship. Because, um, you know, some people are going to say, I mean, nearly everybody's going to say um, that, it's going to depend on how much the costs are. So, uh, the, and the costs, of course, are going to depend on how much you ship because the more you ship, the lower the per volume price is. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so that's that. So, um, you could get an estimate for half a container, for a whole container, for a fifth of a container, uh, or for two containers. And there's also like a borderline thing where, let's say you're 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 going to ship one of these things and there's some real advantages to these kinds of shipments because both because they're uh, less expensive per cubic foot uh, and because they're um, more predictable as far as timing goes if that's a, an advantage for you um, because they go usually straight from your house to the port and straight from the port to uh, um, to the port warehouse and from there straight to your house. So typically these things arrive without ever having been opened. And for that reason, um, they're more efficiently packed, um, both because there's a larger space in there. Um, so it's easier to, to shift things around and accommodate irregularly shaped items. And because there's the things are not packed in such a way that because we know where they're going to be unloaded at the port, like if it's a small shipment, or a smaller shipment, let's say up to five, 600 cubic feet, uh, let's say one bedroom with all the stuff around it. Um, if it's a shipment of that size, then 
in most places, in most cases, it will be shipped in a, a series of these things, not a series, but a group of these things. So goods will be packed on a pallet on this wooden frame, or in the case of some, depending on where you're from, in the Midwest, our agents tend to do everything in lift vans. Um, and in the, most of the other places in the country, um, it, it's done on these pallets, and then they're, they're uh, sealed with very strong uh, dark plastic, like you see at the airport sometimes. Um, so these things um, are really well protected uh, in the event, and it's, it's not the event, it's always gonna happen. When these things are put into a container, they're always gonna be emptied out at the destination port. Uh, whereas one of these things, a, a full container, in nine, 95 times out of 100, they're not gonna be uh, emptied out. Um, or inspected uh, even partially. They might be x-rayed, but emptied out is, is, a, is an exceptional case. And um, one of the situations where that might happen, or you might choose to have it happen, is, uh, I mean, it's, it's not happening so much now. It happened a little bit when they were not allowing people into the country. Uh, and that, that was including new immigrants. So now they've gotten over that. They decided that was a really bad idea. And um, so, so the story was you had to be in the country to clear your new immigrant shipment. So the containers were arriving as planned, according to uh, our, uh, your thoughts of when you were going to arrive. And then some of the customers were not arriving until weeks after the container arrived. So the, you're paying, they were paying both state container storage, because these things are rented, they are not purchased. Uh, they own, they're owned by the shipping company and you have like a week free and after that the rental fees go up and up and you're paying storage fees for the container at the port, which are also not cheap and they also uh, go up more and more uh, with time. So for that reason, so, so what's one of the solutions, not a very good solution, is to empty that out at the port because then you've given the, you've given the container back so you're no longer paying um, storage for the container, and uh, your since it's uh, loose, it's not uh, in a container. Then you suddenly have 28 days of free storage, so you get free storage. But on the other hand, because things were packed with the assumption that this container is never going to be opened except at your house at destination, so they're not packed in these kinds of things with plastic wrap around them or wood around them. They're usually packed in such a way to, to to prevent against one kind of damage, which is um, um, shifting and turning and breakage. So things have to be packed in a certain way, uh, you know, light things on top of heavier things. And if it's a big item, it has to be protected against twisting or um, and turning, you know, torque, they call it. Or uh, if it's a lot of boxes, they have to build like a, a wall of boxes and then they have to, sometimes they have to secure those things Sometimes they fill in even with empty boxes, just with stuffing, just to support the wall. So these kinds of things are um, are packed uh, not to protect against the, the things that they'll be subjected to if they're unloaded at the port, which is moisture and, um, and diesel dust. So uh, for that reason, it's not a good idea. Uh, I mean, first of all, you have to do everything, we and you have to do everything possible to, uh, to have you arrive uh, before your container arrives. And if it does arrive before, then uh, we have to, if, it, if we know that that's a serious possibility, we probably want to crate it first, crate it or pack it as if it's going to be a small shipment. Um, uh, then, then we won't care if it's, uh, if it's unloaded at the port because, you know, because it's protected against moisture and dust. But if it's, just packed as we would pack a normal container. It's it's unfortunate. I mean, it's not, the truth is the damages are more cosmetic than they are anything else, but it's it's pretty discouraging to get like your whole household coated with diesel dust, um, you know, like from the forklifts and stuff. So, and also there are times where uh, these port seat, roofs are not terribly well maintained and then things could leak on them. So, We've had situations like that. So it's not ideal to store a container. 
what we what we can do if we're able to clear it or leave a deposit we've done that before we can leave we've been able to leave a security deposit uh, for what the customs would be if you didn't have rights uh, and then we clear it uh, like in that conditional way and we move it we transfer all your goods into a storage container thereby ending the rental for the container and ending the storage at the port as well so we've saved a lot of money and then when the time comes for you to be able to receive your your container because your house is ready or because you've you've arrived in the country um then we can deliver it then so those are those are ways around the, the issues with uh um you know two possible ways i'm just gonna make a note make a slide next time for that um uh yeah so that so i think hopefully that's that's clear Let's go back and we're going to talk for a moment about what the tax privileges are. Um, they're significant. They can work out to be 30% or more because um, it's not just VAT or sales tax or customs. It's all three of those um, that you're exempt from for most every household products, uh, most all has household goods, um, including furniture, appliances, one of each appliance, um, their car rights, uh, but you they're they're limited taxes, but they're not free of tax. Um, so, and those rights and um, last for three shipments over the course of three years for Olim and returning minors, people who grew up in Israel and left and are returning now. So um, that's a long time to have rights because then you can see you bring a first shipment in of the stuff that you absolutely know that you want and need. And then you can have a makeup shipment if you know if you're if you were discovered that after that you well there's other things that you wanted. And I saw in one of the uh, nefesh benefesh groups that the question came up. Um, somebody made a what he thought was going to be a Ola shipment by uh, from Amazon and that we're going to that is shipped over by DHL or courier and that cannot be counted as a tax free shipment. However. Um, if you ship anything under seventy-five dollars, um, there's no taxes at all. There's no customs clearing. It just comes straight through. So that's there's a sweet spot between uh, forty-nine and seventy-five dollars at Amazon, where uh, still to this day, on a lot of things, you can get free shipping and absolutely no taxes. Above that, um, it's you're paying not only taxes, but you're paying this big surprise of another 30 bucks or so of, um, of custom clearing charges. And it can even go up from there. And they can, if there's something like I recently um, brought in a, um, an Amazon Blink, um, a, um, um, you know, like a, not an alarm, but a, like a doorbell with a, with a intercom and stuff. And they flagged it as being something that uh, requires a telecommunications license. So that took a couple few weeks for us to get. And and they charged a few hundred shekels, like about $80 for customs clearing and storage on this little tiny thing. So that's, that's something that you have to know about. And uh, I guess I should write a page about that. So uh, returning residents, that is to say, Israelis, people who made Aliyah at least six years ago and then were out of the country for at least two years, or it's simply Israelis who were out of the country for at least two years, have nine months from their return. And that, that return starts as soon as they've been in the country for at least four months. And they have two shipments. And it's essentially the same as for uh, Olim or returning minors. Everybody also can bring in um, up to three TVs, three computers, um, but there are taxes on if you bring more than that, or if you bring a second oven or a second uh, fridge, or if you bring sinks, built-in items like sinks or tiles. Um, if, there, if you're bringing in multiples of something, the tax-free item can be the most expensive. Can be the most expensive one, and then you pay taxes on the the thing that's ten years old or five years old, which is going to be valued at almost nothing. So the taxes are going to be almost nothing. Um, Tourists, Israelis, students, all the all they have pay full time. Oh, oh, that's a mistake. Oops. <laughs> returning residents do, um, uh, do have uh, do have rights, not as as presented in this slide. 
um, as students do not have rights, to, but they do have great rights for cars. A, a, a full-time student at an institute of higher learning um, has rights to pay zero taxes, which is pretty amazing, on a car, and he can keep it in the country as long as he maintains that status as a full-time student at an institute of higher learning. So if you do, you can come in as a uh, student and do a um, whatever, you can do a whole set of degrees or you can stay in yeshiva for 10 years and keep the car for the whole time. Um, that's also a, a hidden benefit. I guess people know about it, but that, you know, you, when you come in, if you've already have one or two degrees, they will pay for your third degree or your second degree or your first degree, whatever you don't have yet. So that's a big benefit, which could save hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what degree you're going for. They don't gra guarantee you admission, but they do pay for your tuition. Okay. Um, so you can also bring in, uh, without bringing too much attention to it, you can bring in a personal quantity of food, whiskey, up to, let's say, a few bottles, and then you can bring in uh, more and just pay some taxes on it. There are certain things that you absolutely do not want to bring in, in under any circumstances or have anything that will even tick, you know, even uh, suggest that to the minds of the customs people that you're bringing in a weapon, even even archery equipment uh, or um, your knife collection, you know, unless it's for eating your food with. Uh, seeds, electric bikes and scooters are also big red flags. Uh, a barbecue you can now bring in as of the last two months without any special license. Uh, only one uh, per family and has to be new. Okay, um, so how are prices determined for shipments? And for everywhere except the Midwest, prices are determined by volume. Um, so volume is three dimensions. So just to give, and we have on our website, you can see what a, a chart of what typical volumes are. And, um, and it goes up uh, in, in such a way that when you ship one and a half, here's this formula, if to ship double the, any given volume is gonna cost you one and a half times as much uh, rather than double the price. So if you have a thousand cubic feet and you want to ship two thousand, it's probably not. If the if the if the thousand is going mean, to is going to cost seven thousand dollars, including whatever, uh, and uh, so the the two thousand is going to cost like ten thousand five hundred. It's not going to cost um, fourteen thousand. Okay. So the more you ship, the cheaper the price. And also remember that uh, since you're unless you're absolutely know that you're going to be storing stuff at the port. Um, then you're going to be, um, it's going to be packed as it would be in a container, meaning it's, it's a plan is not to have it taken out of the port. If you absolutely knew that you would be taking it on the port, you would probably pack it already in crates and pallets. Um, or you would, we would do this business about leaving a security deposit um, until, until you're ready to take your goods. Um, also, because things, goods, household goods tend to be, irregularly shaped they're not all just one size box um they're uh it's easier to just it's easier in a big space like that to uh to play with the space and and uh uh and work it around so that you can make the best use of the space so again the the containers both have a lower rate to begin with and um you, you're not paying for this extra space taken up by the crate or by the under the pallet and the plastic. Uh, and also, um, it's easier to pack efficiently. So those three things are going to make it uh, cheaper, dramatically cheaper per uh, volume to ship a big shipment. But to be fair, if you don't have that much stuff that you want to ship, there's absolutely no reason that you would. I mean, we have had people who said, we do not want to share our space with anybody. We want an exclusive container, even though we're shipping, I don't know, uh, 300 cubic feet. This is, you know, precious stuff, and we don't want to have it. We don't want to increase the risk of uh, loss or theft by by putting it in a consolidation. Um, and we're so we're going to ship it in our own exclusive container. We've had that. We've also had people who said, um, let's ship everything by air, uh, which is. Uh, 
also uh, reduces, because the transit time is so much less, it reduces the uh, chance of theft or loss. Uh, also damage, because air shipments are pretty much always uh, packed um, to a, high, a very high level, uh, higher than it would be if it were in a container. Um, okay. Now, just to say that in the Midwest, uh, there are uh, places where they go by weight, which is actually easier to estimate than volume, because volume is subject to um, the situation where they show up at your house and it's a little bit of a balagan, a little bit of a mess, and it's a little bit disorganized and a little bit indecisive. And so that's, uh, it's harder and it's also uh, harder to guess how things are going to fit together in even in a big space, uh, it's certainly in a smaller space, but in a bigger space, uh, it still uh, remains as an issue how things are going to fit together in the most efficient possible way. Again, in a container, it's really much less of a problem. Um, but with weight, it's pretty easy because a refrigerator weighs as much as a refrigerator weighs. It doesn't matter how it's going to fit together with other things. Okay. Uh, so again, the types of shipment are uh, full containers. And actually, nowadays, um, there's a new, well, within the last year, they passed a law which allows you to share a full container with someone else and not have it emptied uh, at the port. And um, you can also, uh, so so you can either share it, this is confusing, not share your empty paper. That's one, yeah, that, that's uh, an option. It doesn't have to be not shared. It, it, it can be shared. Let me just, I, I keep revising this thing every week pretty much. Uh, and it's amazing how I can still find mistakes. Um, and so and the other thing about a full, about a container is it doesn't necessarily have to be full. In fact, let's say we've estimated that you have 1,500 cubic feet, which is three quarters of one of these big containers. Uh, so um, we'll generally quote you as that being the minimum below which the the value the um, the, the price per cubic foot would be higher. So it might even it might not even, it might not pay to ship less than that, uh, and ab above which the price is going to be significantly less. So um, now, so that's like also a subject for warning, which is um, you don't want to listen to um, the packers. Like what what's the story? What what kind of misinformation might they be giving you? There's uh, pretty much no limit as to. Um, as to the kind of information of, of the packers. Now, what does that include? What are the things not to listen to the packers about? Um, it, not to listen to them about the volume of the shipment, how much is going to fit into the container, what rights uh, are included, what they're going to reassemble. All those things are not, that's not their specialty. Their specialty is packing. So you don't want to uh, listen to them about pretty much anything. You want them. And that's another reason why as early as possible you want well before the guy even comes out to do a volume estimate you want to make a couple of lists like a, a first priority list and a second priority list so that you're not caught um, having to sort and make decisions at the last minute you can make decisions later on but do it um do it um, um you know frame it into you know in a way so that it's easier to do like a, an a list and a b list okay um, okay, so and do you understand why? Again, if you, oh, you have it, there are a couple of questions here. One second. Um, 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 you understand why a, a, a full container or an exclusive container is is quicker and more dependably uh, on time, because it usually goes straight from the uh, your house where it's where it's, usually it's like a day uh, to pack up the container and a day to load the container if it's a 40 foot uh, and if it's a 20 foot it's uh, a, uh, like five six hours to pack everything and then another few hours to load everything so and then unless it's some parts of manhattan where they can't bring a container or it's uh, on some mountaintop in vermont where they can't bring a container so in every other instance the two uh, the containers are going to show up at your house they're going to be locked and sealed there, and they're going to go straight from there 
let's say within a few days um, to the port, or actually usually go straight to the port, um, but it doesn't necessarily ship out um, for up to a week. Uh, and then the, the, the sailing is, let's say, a few weeks um, from New York. It's just like 22 days. Uh, from from um, other places, it's usually 30 days, let's say, from Florida, because it actually gets off of one ship onto another. From the West Coast, also, like more like 40 days, and from the Midwest, somewhere in the middle uh, of those of those times. Um, okay, let me let me see what the questions are before I move on. Um, um, so it's a, it's a question. I'm not sure if I want to bring anything. Should I place things in a regular storage unit? And if I decide to bring it, have you repack it? Um, that's that's tricky um, because we um, uh, the one time we had that in recent memory, like within the last couple of years, was a family with a bunch of kids, and they said, "Oh, we're going to store half our stuff until we just see if the kids like it." It's like. And that's probably not the best, you know, psychological, you know, psychologically, it's not the best way to make Aliyah, just like it's not the best way to make a marriage. Like, uh, you know, like they say in Hebrew, uh, it's not a, a Catholic marriage where you can't get divorced. That's true. You can always go back. But when you come over, it's probably better to, you know, to consider that you're going to be staying for a good while. And of course, just like Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, just like do it day by day. You're not going to you know, uh, make snap judgments about just like hopefully you won't after you get married, you, people don't make snap judgments about their uh, spouses and, um, and, you know, keep going. Uh, so in the same way, if you if you store stuff, that's kind of giving your brain a message that, you know, uh, you know, you have kind of one foot here, one foot there. So it, that might make it uh, significantly harder um, to to actually um, they actually bring stuff, but the the bottom line is, um, and also storage is the kind of thing that if you if you like stuff, if you really like stuff, then ship it. If you don't really like stuff, so get rid of it. You know, so it's a pity to to pay storage anywhere, whether it's in Israel or in America. I mean, we'll, we make money from it, but, you know, so I'm not going to complain from that point of view, but. From the point of view of your money, um, storage is like like an open ended thing. So, so it's not a decision of really of whether you're going to find things useful in Israel. I mean, if you have things that you like and things that you think you can fit into a normal apartment. I mean, apartments are smaller here, houses are smaller here, so they'll take up more room. But you can generally fit everything. Uh, it's not like they, you know, we live in dollhouses here. Uh, although it, sometimes it felt that way the first uh, few years that I was here, um, and um, so so the the real question is whether you like the stuff well enough to keep it. If and if you want to keep it, I would say bring it over. If you don't want to keep it, don't store it. Get rid of it. <laughs> you know, it make you know. That's I think that's the intelligent uh, answer to that question. Um, I'm free to. I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss it with anybody, but I think that's the right the right answer. Um, so, okay, again, we've we've uh, we've talked about why exclusive containers are more secure because they're not going to be opened up. Why the timing is better. Why they're less expensive. The few the few reasons why they're less expensive, um, but they're tricky to store. Uh, so those are all the things you remember about that. Um, and the container sizes you know about. There's also the issue about, um, there's also a, something that's 10% higher than this. So that's uh, at 2,200 cubic feet. Uh, smaller, these things. So the way these happen is they're brought to the port, they're brought to our, our agent's warehouse in America or wherever you're coming from. And then they're, uh, they're packed first at your house. And then they're loaded into either into crates or into onto lift vans like this with plastic around it. And uh, and then they're loaded into a container like like this. And why does it take more time? Because certainly in the off season, it takes uh, it can take several weeks.
to fill that container sufficiently uh, to make it worthwhile for our agent to send it out. So that could add a good few weeks or even a couple of months in some parts, you know, in some parts of the world and some sometimes of the, of the year. Um, and also on this side, although that doesn't happen so much, on this side, they also have to fill the truck. So if it's a really small shipment, um, then, um, you know, it might t may take a couple of weeks till we get it onto a truck to get it uh, delivered. And then since I'm mentioning really small shipments, I want to mention something called a mini shipment, which is um, by far the least expensive of any shipment, uh, even though it's it's also the smallest. So whereas um, uh, like an LCL, a typical LCL, the minimum is usually 150 uh, to 200 cubic feet. This, this could be 150 to 200 right here. And this could be like, say, say 35 cubic feet, 40. Um, so the, the mini shipment, it goes up to 35 cubic feet. Um, so, but it only works for stuff that you're having packed. Uh, you're, it's already packed. Like usually it's for new stuff that you're just buying and you have it shipped over to our agent. He puts it on a pallet, ships it over. And the whole thing, including export clearing in America, the documentation, the port fees, the customs clearing, and the delivery to your door, not into your door, which every other shipment is under $1,000. So that's a real bargain if you just want to ship over a bunch of stuff. Like that would have been a solution for this guy who was buying a, stuff, a bunch of stuff at Amazon and wanted to have it come in tax-free. Because this is, this is like the smallest shipment, aside from a small air shipment, um, that, will, that will get it from there to here to your door, um, you know, for under $1,000. That's, you know, it's a, it's a bargain compared to all the others if you only have a, you know, a bit of stuff. And also, you could even ship a couple of these, and the, 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 low, the second one will be a thing, you know, might be uh, two-thirds of the price of the first. So that's also a, a bargain. Uh, storage. We can store stuff at Origin, again, but I, I think it's generally misguided um, unless you're, I, I don't know, in you know, some situation where you have to move out of your house and, but you're not going to be coming to Israel for several months, so you don't want to ship it out. Uh, and it's too much, it's, a, it's going to take up the full container. So in a situ like, situation like that, then we would not show up at your door in a container. We would show up in a big, uh, like a big moving truck, have everything packed, bring it to our warehouse. And, and then when it's ready, and you can also have some new stuff delivered to there. And then when it's ready, we would containerize it and ship it out, but only when it's ready. Um, so that, and that's, it, storage in America is also more expensive than storage in Israel, not dramatically, but it is more expensive. As far as uh, storage on the Israel side, um, you have for a full container only, I said two to four days, and then it becomes costly after a week, it becomes costly uh, for the rental of the container. And after almost right away, it, it's the, the graph starts going whoop, up like that for storage, uh, for taking up space at their port. So again, the solutions are, if you know we're gonna store, I won't go into those, those are uncommon things, but if you know you're gonna need long-term storage, so better um, to have us certify to the extent possible that we can leave a deposit and take your stuff out, um, or that you can fly in for a little while and then and let us clear the shipment and deliver it to storage, a storage container, um, those are the two better options. And for short term, uh, if you're in the country, is we can just move the container after it's cleared out of the port and that thereby avoid the, the port storage. Um, okay. And LCL, the, the smaller shipments, these, these kinds of crates or, or pallets, those get 28 days free. And uh, it's not dramatically expensive. It's still cheaper than in America. Uh, and you can also store part and deliver part. So if you wanted, let's say you're moving to a place that's not your final place uh, and you want to deliver half of your furniture and stuff there um, and the other half you want to store until you're ready to take it. And, and it's, well, again, to answer uh, the question of the person who said how, you know, what, whether you, with the question about what to bring, like, if that's a question, if you're not sure that you want the stuff, then decide we can decide if you want it bring it if you like this stuff and if you don't like it get rid of it don't don't store in america i mean i you can do it people have done it for a long time and that's what i'm saying it's just like it just seems to go on and on and you're you're 
your possibility of your making up your mind in a year's time or six months time or three months time uh, about whether you like the stuff well enough to bring it over uh, is not great. So there's a greater likelihood is, is just keep paying storage until who knows when, until you wake up and decide that you have to make a decision about whether to keep it. Um, so if you like it, ship it. If you don't like it well enough to keep it well enough to ship it, don't, don't store it. That's my advice. Um, so there's also a way that you can, um, we'll talk about marine insurance next, but before we do, I'm just going to say that there's a way to extend marine insurance. Like marine insurance is a very valuable and, um, and uh, useful uh, kind of thing because it covers damage from the time it's picked up and damage and loss from the time it's picked up until the time it's delivered. And you can even continue that coverage while it's in storage if you let it, it you can even put it into a self storage, but it has to be a self storage that we control the access to or our agent controls the access to. Because if we can monitor it, in other words, if we keep track of anything going in or out, then we can continue the marine insurance, which is very cheap and very comprehensive. So you won't get into a situation where you're, you've paid all this money for marine insurance and you don't really know if anything's missing or, or lost. Well, you'll know if anything's missing because there's something called a bingo sheet, which is, um, which is something that allows you to, uh, to mark off if anything is missing. Um, but just one sec, I need some coffee, which I do all the time. Um, so, uh, so it's a, it's a valuable thing. It's not, it's not worthwhile giving up unless, you know, if you put it, if you were going to put stuff into storage and you absolutely do not, you absolutely want free and easy access, putting things in, taking stuff out on a regular basis, um, then what you could do is just, uh, do a good bingo sheet of things, a good register of what came in and what, um, if anything's missing. And then also try to carefully uh, guess, monitor uh, if anything's possibly damaged, because then you can see if something's damaged on the outside. Then what you could do, you have 45 days within which to make a claim. So you could put the stuff towards the entrance and then come later and inspect it uh, for for damage or and uh, and make a claim and get a, a uh, repair estimate. So there, there are ways to handle it. It's worth the effort to. Um, to, um, uh, to 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 uh, extend the marine insurance, uh, unless you're really a genius at detecting damage, and you're very diligent about uh, about your bingo sheet about recording if anything is missing. Okay, now we're going to talk about marine insurance, and what's the deal with marine insurance? Marine insurance covers you for replacement value at destination of a of a similar item or the same item. Um, so there's two, there's two polar opposites. Uh, and one is all risk, which ensures damage and loss uh, as, you know, as well as theft and any sort of other crises. Um, and it also requires professional packing in order to ensure for damage. You can ensure for loss without professional packing. But, uh, and there's, I'll tell you in, the, in another page, I'll tell you how you can do that, even if you, there are some of your goods that you want to pack. Like usually, we our contract is what's called a full pack, which means that we'll pack everything, just not just the delicates and the furniture, but also the books and the clothes and also the non-delicates. But if you want to, let's say you want to uh, pack your own books and clothes because you like them organized in a certain way, and so you can do that and just leave the boxes uh, open, unsealed, and then our packers can seal them after doing a, a superficial inspection and see if anything needs repacking. And then they mark it carrier packed. So thereby enabling all risk insurance, which covers you for uh, damage as well as for loss. Otherwise, you can just insure it for loss. The polar opposite and absolutely worth avoiding at all costs, and even you can consider this a red flag if, if uh, if you're potentially, if you're thinking of going with one of our competitors and he has on his rate sheet total loss insurance, that's a sign that he may not, he, his, he's maybe putting your interests too far behind his own. 
Um, and what it covers is, and only, is total loss, is absolutely total loss, meaning uh, the, sh the container gets thrown in the water, uh, which happens about once every, uh, I don't know, 20 years or something, that uh, containers get, it, it, it happened in Nashville, I don't know, five years ago. It happened 35 years ago, uh, one of the, <laughs> One of the ships was uh, like they they load the they load the containers on the top of the they're supposed to load them in the belly of the container but they also load them on the top and if during high seas when the, when uh, everything's very chaotic at the ocean um, it, they they want to keep a, as low a center of gravity as possible so if they've loaded these things too high I could show I could worthwhile showing a picture of a of a high High loaded container, uh, then they they rarely, but they have in the past sometimes decided. I guess we're going to have to throw off some of the containers that are on the top. So they just you know unbound them and somehow got them over the edge. And but they weren't so experienced at that. So uh, like about I think I don't know, thirteen containers ended up going over into the water in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, so uh, why am I saying that? Because that's, um, that's what total loss covers and only covers. It only covers absolutely total loss, absolutely catastrophic. So it's not a reasonable thing to spend your money on. Um, there, is a, there is a way if you want to spend the absolute minimum, which is like 60 cents a cubic foot on, um, on insurance, the, the way to do that is just to list the things and their replacement values in Israel uh, or wherever you're going, um, to list those things with their replacement values that you want to insure and group insure, like if all the books are of similar value or there's a bunch of chairs of similar value, you can group those together and list those. And thereby you can possibly get away with, uh, with just insuring things uh, for, a, for a, you know, $500 or something like that. I mean, not you know, paying only $500, I'm insuring for like $14,000, which is when one of those containers that went in the drink uh, was a guy, I remember to this day, it was only 35 years ago, why shouldn't I remember it, <laughs> that um, the guy um, had insured his, it was like his, his whole, um, his grandfather's, uh, in Judea kind of stuff, and, it, and he had insured it for fourteen thousand dollars. So, anyways, it, it, once again, that's uh, that's uh, that's total loss insurance. It's a it's a it's a bad sign if somebody offers it to you as a serious option, and um, and it's worth avoiding. It's worth doing a minimum a, a minimal sort of insurance if you want to. The the more uh, likely kind of insurance that people uh, what people usually choose is something called lump sum. Which is has a twenty five percent discount on the rate for um, the values inventory, uh, and it ensures the whole shipment is valued based on at least, and you can decide to insure it for more. In some cases, that's appropriate um, at twelve dollars a pound, and uh, which results in a high value, which is why we, get, we are able to give this discount, and it insures everything up to three thousand dollars without having to list it. So, whereas with a, this kind of uh, comprehensive value inventory, you have to, in some form or another, list everything in the shipment, even if it's groups of items of similar value. Um, and you also have to estimate, uh, as best as you can, the replacement values of things, which is no small feat. We do have a, um, a, a spreadsheet for likely replacement multiple. So that will help you get to values. But if you over-insure it, then you're throwing money out. If you under-insure it, then you're, under, you're under-covering yourself. It's not the best usage, but whatever. Um, so with even with lump sum, you do have to make a list, but only of the items that you want to insure for more than, um, than $3,000 a piece or a group. Okay. Um, Okay, so let me see if, let me see if I, there's a question. Are transformers still noisy? No, transformers are not, uh, well, put it this way. Our, we have a transformer that's, um, that we've been feeding, using to feed our refrigerator for, I don't know, at least 20, probably 25 years. And we don't, 
notice it. I don't think it's noisy. Nobody else has noticed it being noisy. Um, after many years, it probably does make a certain amount of noise. But and we use a, uh, we have a really big transformer, a similar size as for the fridge, that we sh schlep upstairs whenever we want to use um, the uh, KitchenAid, and that doesn't make any noise at all. So if a transformer is buzzing, that's a sign that it's um, that it's not in good shape anymore. And nowadays things are like Amazon sells like a 1500 watt uh, transformer, which is big enough for pretty much everything and anything um, for a hundred dollars. So you could just have it delivered to the shipper and put that in or put two of them in it or whatever. And those, and it's, it, it won't buzz for quite a while. <laughs> you know, as I said, 20, I don't think ours is buzzing. Could be, could be, we just got used to it. I, I don't think it is. Um, is it, yeah, we can send a recording of this webinar. We also have a, a bunch of other webinars. We can send recordings. Maybe I'll put all of <laughs> something else to do is put a bunch of webinars up on the, on YouTube or something. We have some up already on a, we have a YouTube channel. If anybody knows a good uh, social media person, we're always looking for somebody to help help with that. We're also going to do, start doing podcasts and stuff. So if anybody knows anybody who's good at that and not over, overpriced, anyways. Um, so yeah, we'll send a uh, we can we'll send you in fact a link uh, afterwards to um, to a webinar, a similar webinar. And if you want this exact one, this one uh, is being recorded and. Um, and I didn't fiddle around too much at the beginning. Uh, so this transformer this would be for an adjustable electric bed. Oh, so noise is important. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's a good question. So there is um, two things I could say about that. Um, one is um, uh, the adjustable part of it is it's not going to, it's not like, um, uh, I don't know if any of you know who Michael Greger is, nutrition.org, but he recommends for weight loss that, at, that your, your bed go up, the foot of your bed go up by six degrees, which is not a, like putting a brick under it, uh, and then, then, but only for like a few hours and then go down again. So unless you have some a programmable uh, bed that's going to be moving around in the middle of the night by itself, uh, what you could do is um, what I did, what, what I have, right here for I have an uh, this is a standing desk here and under the standing desk is a, uh, a cheap um, uh, um, a um, treadmill and uh, since I don't want to have the um, transformer plugged in all the time because that you know if, if it does start buzzing or if it's it uses up a certain amount of electricity so you don't want it so but you what you can do and what I did is you just attach a uh, an on-off clip, an on-off, uh, my English is gone. <laughs> like Rob Riskin says, he became alingual after a while. He forgot a lot of his English and he hadn't yet mastered Hebrew. So anyways, um, so what you can do is when you're going to, you can just turn it on uh, when you get in bed at night and you want to adjust your bed. And then right before you go to sleep, just and just turn off the transformer because you're not going to, unless you're going to keep adjusting it in the middle of the night. Um, there's also something uh, we're going to hopefully start growing uh, um, uh, um, you know, mushrooms. That's another project I have, uh, you know, what's it called? Uh, reishi and all these fancy mushrooms that aren't yet available here. Um, so we're, uh, I was talking to somebody in California about a, uh, a fan. So I looked on the internet and there's a way to build a, an acoustic uh, box around whatever it is that's making noise, which uh, redu greatly reduces the sound. So that's another option. But I think the better option is the simpler one, which is um, which is just to attach an on us switch before the transformer. So you turn the transformer on. Um, yeah. And I, re I recommend those. Uh, that was a, a splurge. We bought one of those uh, adjustable beds here with a temporary pedic because of consumer reports said it was most people like them the most. Anyways, uh, what are some red flags for uh, too cheap quotes? So one of them, obviously, if it's too good, if it's dramatically cheaper than our price or people in our league, then 
there's, there's likely something uh, compromised. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, uh, here, they are already written. So one example is, let's say you have enough for a container, like anything over 650 cubic feet in most places. And they say, oh, but we're going to give you a much better price than a full container. We're going to ship it together with who knows how many other people in a container. And but what does that mean? You remember what that means? If it's if it's combined with more than one person, it means that it's going to be unloaded at the port. So uh, what that means in, in terms of real practice is all the benefits that you would have had with a container, namely uh, more efficient packing, not having uh, taken up space on. Um, uh, well, let me just say it this way, that um, if it's going to be dumped out of the port, then it's going to be exposed in a way that you would not like it to be exposed. Because whereas if you had shipped it in this kind of a shipment with, with uh, uh, lift vans and crates and, um, and pallets under, and you know, with plastic over it, then you wouldn't worry about it being. But if it's packed as a normal container would be packed, but just combined with many other people, more than one other person, then it's going to be emptied out of the port. So it's going to get to you unless they Haifa apparently is somewhat better but still in all even if it doesn't come with a lot of moisture and, and diesel dust um, then it's the chances of loss and theft are much greater that's that's simply a given because you're going to have um instead of a, a shipment like this we're going to have let's say if you have five of these you have five pieces on your uh, on your uh, bill of lading you're going to have 150 pieces or 250 pieces because that's how many pieces would have gone into a container so that's a sign of also i mean the basic thing you're obviously looking for as with any merchant is um you're looking for where did i put it um here you're looking for a merchant whose self-interest is not going to be at your expense all right he's not going to make decisions uh, uh, on your behalf which are going to which are going to be bad for you, um, okay? And so, and that is somebody who's offering you a really cheap price means that he's probably making a decision for you like this, which is not any, it's fully in your interest. The other uh, red flag is uh, if somebody offers total loss insurance, which you remember is um, pay is all or nothing and probably has the same chance of winning as uh, winning of getting a payout as pay, playing the lottery um, it's if somebody offers to that and I know one of our you know competitors who's like has all sorts of credentials and everything offers this for a one and a half percent which is like nuts because we offer our our uh, lump sum insurance for not tremendously more different price than that which is serious insurance that covers every risk under the sun and this is offering all or nothing basically zero chance of collecting you know but this you'd be better off just suck you know i don't know taking the money out and burning it than uh than paying for insurance so if somebody's offering that to you it's a sign again that their interest their self-interest has has um has overcome their sense of service uh, to a serious degree um okay so and of course you want to get recommendations we um baruch hashem we've had um we you know, we seem to get more and more here maybe it's just people are willing to talk i always suspect my um truckers of drugging are uh the people when he delivers to me because we he's been sending us videos and these people are like all so happy it's like what's what's going on here but anyways um so you want to use somebody who you can get a lot of recommendations about and through experience this is a new yorker um, thing about a sample of somebody who's a really cheap um, um trucker but it also this always reminds me of we already talked about what to bring that kind of thing. It, it always reminds me of we'll get to it in a second let me just jump to it about uh what how to avoid surprises and what kind of surprises there are so um because if you have, let's say you have a container and it's, it's about uh, 11 feet high and seven feet wide and including the chassis and the cab, it's, 
it's like 60 feet long, uh, you know, 40 feet. And if you have, let's say, really small, narrow streets, or something like German Colony or the Old City or, you know, places like that, or um, we have a customer, I think, who just moved to some place in the north that also is like not so easily accessible. Or if they have um, overhanging trees so that the truck can't come through. Or if you if there's no place to park, so the truck won't be able to park within 25 meters. All of those things would usually incur what's called a shuttle uh, delivery in smaller trucks. And depending on, like we've had situations where we had to deliver in in uh, what are those things called where the guys pull it in a uh, uh, never mind. I said um, in really in some really small vans uh, because um, because. They're, they're, you know, like it was someplace in the, well, first of all, in the old city, they, you can't drive a truck in there. So you, they have like, um, I don't know what it's called in English or in Hebrew. It's a, it's like a, um, a little motorized, um, like one of those kind of those things that you drive in the outback. It's one of those things. So um, that's, uh, you, you have to transfer it to those things. So that would incur additional costs. Uh, other kinds of things that might incur additional costs are if you have a really narrow stairwell or a really low low ceiling stairwell, or if you have a really old elevator or no elevator and you live above the second floor. So then we might go to something like this, which is a ladder, um, a ladder crane. It go, brings everything up on it. And these are quite inexpensive compared to the other kind. And we even had a, sh a shipment recently where um, we had to deliver to the first floor, just one floor up, the second floor in America. Terms, um, because the, her furniture was too big to get through her main entrance, but it wasn't too big to get through her porch entrance. So we brought everything up to her porch. Uh, and arm cranes are more expensive, and what they do is they, they lift things over and down, and, and they can get into a big window or they can get onto a big porch. Uh, so those are the possible surprises. And why why are we say we try we avoid surprises? How do we do that? Because we ask these questions early on. If you know, a lot of people come and don't even really know where they're moving to. Um, so in that in that case, um, you know, you can't really avoid it if, if you're moving to a place with difficult access. But if you do know where you're moving to, then we can predict whether it's going to need a shuttle. If you're moving to Nakla Odra, the old city in Jerusalem, um, or Tzfat, you know, we, we can predict you're going to need a shuttle. Or if you're moving to the fifth floor and there's no elevator or no big elevator, that too we would predict that we would use a crane. Okay, um, let me see if there's other questions before I answer these things. Uh, I have a bit. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned that, but I'll answer it again because it's 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 kind of hard to get all the points. Um, someone's asking. Uh, let's see if it's someone who's actually still here. One second. Um, uh, uh, one second. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, the deal is this: for storing in a container, um, you can do one of a few different things. You can either just store it in America until you know you, that you're going to want it within, let's say, four weeks. Or you can uh, bring it over here and clear through customs if you're going to be in the country, and then transfer it into a storage container and have it delivered in the storage container. Those are the best options. Uh, there are other options if you if you're not going to be able to come to the country, but I, those are too uh, peculiar to go into um, and unusual, I'd say. So, but there are, there are other options. Um, so let's see. Uh, vehicles. People do ship in vehicles. Uh, mostly because they can save money. Uh, and why can they save money? Because the depreciation is so high. They bring in used cars, uh, two, four, six, eight, whatever the age is. Olim and returning um, miners can bring in vehicles up to any age, as long as it has the latest, latest safety features. Um, returning residents can bring in vehicles up to four years old, compared with uh, Israelis who can bring in vehicles up to two years old. And the depreciation is such that it's like 20% the first year, 10% subsequent years. So after four years, it could be 50%. So you'd be paying half the taxes that you would have paid if you had brought in a new car. 
Okay, and costs are significant, probably close to $6,000 um, as basic costs for the shipping, the licensing. It takes usually a couple of weeks to get out. You have to present your license over there. Uh, export customs clearing, import custom clearing, inspection, safety changes, all that stuff costs a fair amount of money. But if you help, if you want, we can help you do the math and you might end up saving quite a bit of money. Um, and taxes, they're actually a lot greater range of taxes than are presented here because of the hybrid cars. Hybrid cars for everybody, not just for Olim, are now at about 80%. Electric cars are between 20 and 40 percent, um, and so Toshav Chazer has the same amount of taxes as a regular Israeli, but they can bring in a car that has another two years of depreciation, which could add another 20 percent depreciation. So that's good savings. And why do people bring them in? They bring them in because, like some like a Toyota Sienna, like a van that people would want aren't sold here, uh, or the pricing is so high. Um, that it's not worthwhile, and you have the chance of coming in here and finding someone who was bought, brought in a car, a tax-reduced car, and namely another Ole, and selling exactly the car that you want is pretty remote. So if you want a certain car and it's not sold here, but it can be serviced here because it's it's something that's uh, it's, that's similar in motor, uh, you know, it's a, it is a Toyota, it is a Honda, it is a Tesla, whatever. Um, then you know that's probably not something to worry about. Uh, we've we've seen a, a, a presentation by somebody who bought him a Tesla, and Tesla helped him find an adapter so we could charge it from his home. So there are cars that are not exactly the same model that are brought in, but still are uh, have a sufficient amount of support that you wouldn't have you wouldn't have to worry about it, um, or at least I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, packing, as I mentioned, is full, partial, or no packing. No packing is very risky, uh, both because you cannot insure it, uh, and because um, uh, I mean you could insure it total loss, you know, or you could uh, you could even insure it for theft, um, but you couldn't insure it for damage because damage things have to be professionally packed. Uh, partial means they're packing just the delicates in the furniture, and full means they're packing everything. And so then, if you're if you have full pack. And you still want to insure for damage, and you still want to pack some of your own boxes. You would let the packers inspect, seal, and mark them as carrier pack, thereby you know, avoiding the limitation of, uh, of just insuring for loss and theft. So that's a good trick to know. Um, so this we already explained why FCLs are quicker and more predictable, why LCLs take longer or less predictable. Uh, custom screwing, this too, we try to ask questions early on. Right away after you sign with us, we already start collecting documents, whichever you have, uh, in order to avoid, uh, in order to be able to start clearing even before the shipment, uh, processing your documents even before the shipment arrives in the waters of Israel. Uh, okay. Uh, delivery for all, uh, everything except those mini shipments that cost under $1,000. Delivery is, is into your home, putting goods where you want them, unwrapping used furniture, we even if somebody our truckers are uh, big pussy cats, so that even if if it's not in our contract, uh, we had somebody who said, "We know what's on the contract, but we still want you to do it, um, and we want you to unwrap our new furniture and, and assemble it, and blah blah blah." And they did it anyways. I think they got a good tip. But they did it anyways. We also throw away the gross debris, the big boxes and wrapping material, and we can also help you find people afterwards if you. Some people bring in hundreds of boxes, so it takes them months to go through them. And we can come uh, and get someone to, to uh, also to assemble stuff that's more complicated, as well as the takeaway boxes. Um, the assembly is usually only of simply used furniture, which is disassembled at origin. And that really is really amounts to just tables, uh, simple tables and simple bends. Uh, everything else we can refer people, we can refer handymen to you. And uh, there's also something called Midrag, M-I-D-R-A-G dot C-O dot I-L, which you can you do right click and translate to English, where you can find all sorts of uh, service providers. And there, and the commitment you make when you use Midrag is to give a comprehensive review of the people. So there, there's reviews, hundreds. And, I mean, you don't have to read all the reviews. They, they have a rating system. But I found it to be a very good way 
to find um, very uh, self-conscious, um, as, I mean, in a positive sense, um, service-oriented um, uh, service people. Um, okay, we mentioned about difficult access. And also, if you have any problems along the way, whatever it is, uh, even if, you, if it's a psychological, if it's, you're, you're, you know, if you don't believe it's uh, objectively true, but you feel it's true anyways, um, you know, let us know about it. We'll try to deal with it uh, as best we can. Uh, okay, we talked about, we did this already, about all the possible surprises, which we can avoid if we know about it early. Um, and types of storage, a full container is two to four days, uh, 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 consolidated shipment, 28 days. This is no longer true because uh, uh, customs inspections are very rare out of America uh, or Canada. It used to be very frequently out of LA, but now LA has gotten its uh, karmic payback for doing so many uh, uncalled for inspections. Uh, and now they're, we basically have to ship out of uh, Northern California if we want to uh, ship, you know, a shipments from LA. Um, but uh, still on the import side, if it's coming in and it's a self-pack shipment and you've made your own packing list, or if you have any hint that you may have any of those forbidden items like a, a scooter that's electric or a bike that's electric or seeds or weapons or whatever like that, then that could be called a reason for an inspection. Um, and they have good intuitions for some reason. Um, you know, we had a customer who brought in, I don't know, I don't know how many pianos he declared, but they decided to inspect it and it ended up they had 12 pianos, which is not the number that he declared. And they were they were very kind to him, and they they did make him get a, a business license, but still in all they were they treated him extremely well. Um, I yeah I whatever they treat uh, Olin pretty well in general, so don't expect that everywhere, uh, but um, the customs does. Other um, uh, things that could incur additional charges are things that are heavier like a sub-zero refrigerator or a big safe, or if you have 50 boxes, 50 more, or more boxes of books, those could also occur. And they, but they won't be surprised if we know about it in advance, we can, we can uh, make an appropriate charge early on. In terms of what's happening now, even though we have no clue about if there's another one coming around the corner, a new, uh, what's that, what comes after Omicron, maybe it's Pi. Uh, and, um, so, but sometimes we've had we've had uh, whole um, crews of ships that got COVID, and so they they canceled that sailing, and then we had to, our customers had to pay a couple hundred dollars just to leave things on the truck until we could get a uh, another booking, another container, not another container because it was the same company as containers, uh, but it was another sailing uh, port congestion. It, it's getting. It's getting weirder and weirder. I mean, also because not just because of the what they call it, the chain supply, where because, supposedly because China like went to sleep for a few months or several months because of no orders from America, and then they got too many orders, and now things are backed up incredibly. So aside from that, there's also this factor of people in America deciding that they'd rather not work. Or they'd rather not work as truckers. They they stayed home during the COVID, and they decided it wasn't so as bad as they feared it was, and they kind of liked being at home with their family or friends, and so they decided they don't want. So this is this, in Europe, in Northern Europe especially, and in America, there's this dramatic shortage of truckers. So, uh, anyways, those things happen. We haven't actually, we've, we've experienced that mostly on shipments leaving from Israel to America, uh, not so much on the uh, uh, shipments uh, from Israel, from America to Israel. Um, so uh, storage origin, that's really only if you call for it, if you decide you want a storage origin. These kinds of unusual sounding uh, fees are pretty unusual. But they're more, they're no, I used to call these charges a red flag for, uh, for uh, you know, self-interest on the part of the shipper. But nowadays, some, sometimes it's actually real. But I would still ask for a third party um, 
evidence that somebody adds this to your bill. Um, and it's it's weird because some of some of our agents, you know, say, "Oh, general rate increase," and we see uh, and other other of the like fifty of the highly respectable agents, like just like uh, not agents but uh, competitors, let's say, and then somehow they get rate increases that nobody else was getting. Anyway, it's not to be too cynical. Um, discounts we're always happy to compare um, apples with apples and help you interpret other quotes you've gotten to make sure that. Um, um, there's, uh, there's some, some contracts like not just in shipping, but in everything, they're masters of ambiguity. So we'll have a, like a sent, they'll have two sentence fragments, which you can run together as one sentence and it has one meaning, or you can read them separately with an entirely different. Meaning. So we can help you, uh, parse and de the, um, decode, uh, yeah, what your, um, any quotes that you want us to compare with ours. Um, and we're stacked entirely by North American value for now. We had an Israeli for a while, a student working here, but that um, he had to concentrate on his studies. Um, that's it. That's, I think that's that's pretty much the presentation that I wanted to give you. Uh, here's contact information. Um, this is this is all. Uh, this is the, these are the extensions for Yael, who's head of sales, and these are all toll free numbers. Um, Daniel, if you have any technical customs questions, uh, his, yeah, El can always field those for you, uh, and she'll refer them to Daniel, or his email is the same as El's, mine is the same as El's, also just with Neil and EIL, and Daniel is Daniel and Kev. Um, the other people you don't need to get to know yet, uh, they have to do with their shipping insurance, with billing, and so forth. So, I think that's at least if we missed any questions. Uh, is the shipping been directed in the US to Israel? It's going to make us up in there. So um, most of the vessels, um, and you can you can request it or require it, um, that uh, not to stop in Europe. We, we actually had um, a customer who was willing to pay. Um, we gave we gave them the option of, um, anyway, it's not worth quoting the details of that because of which it's a customer that not typical of, uh, in any way. Um, but the answer is that uh, we actually shifted her after, because um, uh, we, we were going to save her like $7,000, which is a lot of money, um, by shipping out of um, some uh, northeastern city instead of out of New York uh, and using a shipment that was going to stop in Europe. And then she decided that at the end that that was not worth her while, so she paid uh, even more than that to have it transferred to Zim, which is a direct sailing to Israel, and, uh, and it's scheduled to arrive in about a week, exactly a week. So whereas the other containers would have been, because they were transshipments and they're just that's their culture, uh, not only. Are they going to stop in Greece for one to four weeks? But they're going to, they're, they're they were late to leave if they ever left at all. So yes, um, there are direct sailings available, and you can absolutely specify them. And in fact, we in nine times. I mean, I don't even think we ever uh, use the um, the transshipments if we can avoid them. Um, having said that, there are situations where where uh, even Zim. Well, I mean, they're nowadays they're more and more unusual. Um, uh, like there was there was a threatened um, port strike coming up, and the government managed, in which is pretty unusual, they managed to actually negotiate around it. Actually, it's not so unusual. They once had a s story where uh, the, the port of Ashdod threatened to strike because uh, the government was going to take away uh, like some free um, steak dinner at one of the owners of the. One of the main, um, uh, like the people who supervise the port, who owned a steak, a steak yeah, uh, if for you know as a like a as a chupar, as a benefit, as a, a special favor for people who performed well at the port, and the government, the government said, oh sorry, you have to take that away, and they said, okay, we'll just like strike for a couple of days. It's gonna cost you cost the country like a billion dollars or a billion shekels, and they said, oh okay, fine, you can keep your steaks. So it's that kind of thing that, that has forced the government's hand. 
and now China is building the uh, the deep water port in Israel. So, um, but yes, uh, so it's a, what the point I, I failed to make that point. The point is that even Zim sometimes, God forbid, in cases of war or real strikes, they've had to unload and declare end of voyage in uh, in France or Egypt, places like that. And unlike in the the battle days when they would say. Um, yeah, we declared end of voyage. We're allowed to do that, and it's and you have to pay it if you want it to get it all the way to Israel. Paid another couple of thousand dollars. So when there was such a fuss that when they did that, that they never did it again. So if they had to unload in um, whatever it's called, port something in Egypt or in uh, somewhere in France or Italy, they paid to bring it in, but it was delayed. Uh, you can ship a single electric. No, do not ship an electric scooter at all. There, I mean, if you if you really are sentimentally attached to your, you know, your electric scooter, um, there may be a way to bring it in. But uh, my understanding is that uh, it would require a dramatic amount of uh, of uh, clearance to get it through. But it doesn't hurt to ask. I, I um, we you in the past we've just tried to scare people. Uh, from bringing it in, but if you if you want to try it, we're we're game to to investigate. The answer might well be don't even think about it. Um, it probably is. But uh, okay, can you ask power of attorney to use a cater in it? If the Israel still in it? yeah, we always use a power of attorney. In other words, I should have maybe said that that um, in almost no cases do you have to go to the port to see your shipment. Uh, it's very rare that there's a customs inspection that requires your presence. Um, and it, I mean, almost never, I would say, because even in the event of a customs inspection, you can also, you're still appointing the customs crew to do it. Um, and uh, so, and in the 95% of the time that there's no customs inspection, there's no reason to go to the port at all. Uh, we've had customers who decided they wanted to go to the port in order to save some thousands of dollars when they were clearing a car. They wanted to do the running around. But that was somebody who was close to the age of 30 and very uh, brave. So it's not something that you need to do or would want to do. Um, let's see. Um, I guess I'll tell you. When I, uh, you know, in the old days, I would try to, you didn't have to be a customs clearer officially to go to the port and clear a shipment. And I would try once in a while to go. It was only things were only coming into Haifa. And I would try, you know, to go and clear like three or four shipments. And I was saying, was it? It was just never worth it. No matter how much money I may have saved, it was never worth it. Um, is it safe? Can you ship a car? Yes, it's always um, shipping a car in a container is always the way to go, unless you uh, don't care if it comes dinged up. Uh, there is a way to ship a car called a roll, roll, roll on, roll off. Which, um, which is like a ferry, uh, you know, a, um, a cross-Atlantic ferry, uh, and it's cheaper. It saves a thousand bucks or so, and um, and uh, but it's it's so risky that our marine insurance company won't touch it. So, um, yeah, you can do it, but it's it usually goes in a container, and you cannot put stuff in the ship in the in the car aside from things that are directly related to the car, like, you know, whatever, a spare tire and a, whatever those things are called, lift the car. Um, but, you know, you can't fill it full of belongings. You can, and, and again, in the old days, maybe I should update my, my information, but uh, in the old days, it shows you what I, what I do and don't do in this office. Um, in the old days, they, I'm pretty sure nobody's doing it anymore. They would build a, uh, a like a raft, a, um, a platform above the car and they would load that uh, up with more stuff. So uh, everything's doable if, you know, maybe, um, but it's, uh, it's not done. And in fact, um, we, uh, we tried not long ago, I, when I was, I got involved with the shipment and tried to convince them to let us put stuff around the car, like really close to the car. Nope. This has to be a divider. The car is in one part of the container. The rest of the stuff is in another part of the container. And, um, uh, and part of the reason for that is that the car has to be uh, emptied out of the port, whereas the rest of the stuff does not have to be emptied out of the port. 
So otherwise they would be in a situation where they, they would have to take the car out and then empty the car back into the container and do a recount of the stuff that's in the container because it wasn't counted. You know, you get the idea. It's not permitted um, and um, not likely that anybody would allow it. Uh, let's see. Um, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your appreciation and your patience. That's uh, your, you uh, broke a record, I think, uh, in terms of uh, this is uh, you know an hour and thirty three minutes Good going <laughs> for you guys to be able to stay awake that long. And uh, and we'll send you copies of, of not this presentation. This you can get later if you like. Uh, just let me know, and um, and of a previous presentation and other kinds of things like that. Okay, so be safe, and um, and I hope to hear from you. Take care. Bye -bye.